For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today we are joined by Palestinian lawyer and activist Diana Butu and we are going to be talking about the Israeli annexation plan that was originally scheduled to begin on the 1st of July. Now, according to this plan, the Israeli government had announced that it would take over the land on which legal settlements are built. It would take over large parts of the Jordan Valley and thus a considerable part of the occupied West Bank would have come under direct Israeli control. It would have been annexed by Israel, exactly, to, to put it exactly. So we have with us Diana to talk about this. Thank you so much for talking to us, Diana. And uh, to begin with, could you first talk about since uh, July 1st, what has exactly been happening on the ground? Because uh, the government does not exactly seem to have released details about whether it has started the plan, whether it is going ahead with the plan, or whether it has put it on the back burner for some time. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to first uh, keep in mind that there was nothing sacred or special about July the 1st. Uh, that was listed as the first date that they could begin annexation. And uh, the way that they were going to begin annexation was through one of two methods. One was to either put forward a law into the, the, the Knesset, the parliament, or through um, a cabinet bill doing the same. And the reason that July 1st was the date that was specified was that this was the date that was spelled out in the agreement between Netanyahu and uh, his once rival, who then became his ally, Benny Gantz, as being the first date that such legislation could be introduced. So we don't know if, um, if things are on hold. We don't know what the shape of annexation looks like. What we do know is that it hasn't been called off. There hasn't been a statement by Netanyahu backing off of it. We haven't heard Gantz back down from it either. In fact, all that we've been hearing is that uh, they haven't yet put forward the details of it, in large part because we are now here experiencing a second wave um, when it comes to the spread of the coronavirus. And this particular government was a government that was enacted only to address the coronavirus, with one exception, and that is annexation. So I don't suspect that things are going to be canceled. In fact, I just suspect that it's going to be somewhat delayed until uh, a little bit of a later time, but certainly no later than when the U.S. elections take place. That's what I, that's what I predict. Right. So uh, to take maybe a step backwards, something you and many other commentators have pointed out, of course, is that annexation per se is not something new. It's, this is not any new thing. It's been happening for decades. We've seen, for instance, the demolition of houses, the takeover of lands. We've seen a lot of other atrocities. We've also seen steps like the building of the apartheid wall, for instance, which in many ways basically uh, create the structure for that. But even so, in that sense, how do you see the, uh, this uh, move marking, for instance, a new phase in the occupation uh, that is taking place right now? Over the course of the past 53 years, we've seen two different approaches take place when it comes to the occupation. The first approach, which has um, been the approach that the, we've seen over the course of the, the majority of the years, has been what's called the quiet approach, or what others have termed creeping annexation or de facto annexation. And in that system, what's done is that we've already seen the measures of annexation on the ground, but it's been done quietly. So we've seen the construction of 130 settlements. We've seen that there are now 700,000 Israeli settlers, which just to put it in perspective, that's 25% uh, of the population of the West Bank. We've seen that uh, checkpoints, there's nearly 700 checkpoints and roadblocks in place in the, in the West Bank. We've seen the construction of the wall. We've seen land confiscation. We've seen home demolitions. Um, We've seen settler violence. These are all measures that have been undertaken now for 53 years. The difference between that and the other approach, which is the loud approach, is that in the past, while it was all done very quietly, along comes Netanyahu, who says, I'm not going to do things quietly any longer. And I'm going to be bold. And I'm going to be in your face about it. And watch. I want to see if the world's going to stop me. And so it's important to keep in mind that in 2018, when Israel passed 
um, a law that was called the Jewish nation state law, which is a law that privileges Israel's Jewish citizens over its non-Jewish citizens. It's a Jewish supremacy law in effect. Again, he didn't have to do that uh, because the, the Israeli Supreme Court was already on side with everything that the government had been doing. And it had already instituted this measure of Jewish supremacy. The difference was is that he wanted to be loud about it and he wanted to be bold and he wanted to see if the world would stop him and they didn't. And so too, when it comes to this current phase of annexation, all that he is doing is he is saying to the world, I want to see if you're going to stop me. It formalizes the system of apartheid as we already know it. And the only thing that makes it different is that now he's saying to the world, I'm going to institute apartheid and I want to see if you are going to stop me. On the ground, it may not change a lot. There will be some changes and I don't want to undermine those. Um, I do believe that, the, that this move will embolden the Israeli settler movement. It will allow the settlers to go and attack Palestinians with a lot more um, freedom. I think that it's also going to embolden the settlers to build and expand more settlements. I think that it's also going to embolden the Israeli government to demolish more Palestinian homes. And I think it's going to embolden the Israeli government to try to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. So I don't want to say that there's no, um, no substantive difference between pre-annexation and post-annexation, but the difference in the minds of the Israeli government, the reason that this is being done now is because he can. Right. So uh, this, of course, has a lot to do with Trump's a so-called deal of the century itself. A lot of the Netanyahu's annexation plan is very closely connected to Trump's plan as well. But uh, let's take this question also to that of the two-state solution. Now, we know that the two-state solution has basically been, has virtually been dead for quite some time. There's been talk of it, but clearly the situation on the ground is completely changed. So what does this annexation plan do to this two-state solution? The two-state solution died the minute that the Israelis were unwilling to uproot any settlers. And, uh, and sadly, that was in 1968. Right. Um, and, and so we've been living since that time with this myth that somehow Israel is going to end the settlement enterprise, that it's going to mm -hmm. withdraw the settlers, that it's going to end its colonial rule. And we know that it won't. Mm -hmm. The difference between, between that position and what's happening now is that while we Palestinians have known this for quite some time and have been articulating this for many, many years, this is now the first time that the international community is realizing the death of the two-state solution, which is why they're pushing back so hard mm -hmm. on this issue of annexation, is the, the issue of annexation, formal annexation, does two things to the, um, the international community. It forces them to reconcile with the fact that there is not going to be a two-state settlement, and it forces them to reconcile with the fact that there is no peace process. And given that this is uh, where the state of affairs is, it requires that they actually put into place measures to stop annexation. But we've known for, for 53 years that Israel will never withdraw or evacuate its settlements. Right. So the other key question was also regarding the Palestinian Authority itself, because it as an institution, it was a product of the Oslo Accords and also is very closely associated with the idea of the two-state solution itself. And uh, this annexation plan, for instance, is more of an existential threat to the PA than maybe anything in the recent past. Now, the PA did say that it is going to cut uh, any kind of relations with Israel and it has taken a strong position. But as of now, are the, what are the options before it in terms of responding? The Palestinian Authority, you rightfully point out, it's a creation of Oslo. It's so uh, directly affiliated with Oslo. Their options are uh, very limited at this point, and I think that they're recognizing this. I think first, I want to just very quickly tackle the issue of um, ending, um, cutting ties with Israel, and what that means. You know, many people were looking at this issue of ending security collaboration as being that the Palestinian Authority is no longer going to arrest people at Israel's behest um, and it's no longer going to imprison people at Israel's behest. That's only part of the picture. The problem is, is that Israel has transformed civilian life into entirely security measures. And what that means is that if you are 
for example, a merchant and you want to import in goods from, let's say, India or from China or from Turkey or from anywhere around the world, you actually need a security permit to be able to do that. If you are um, a, a cancer patient and your cancer needs any form of radiation, you cannot get radiation therapy in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip because radiation equipment, you know, something as life-saving, is considered to be um, is considered to be something that is beyond Israel's security. Uh, uh, what they what they're willing to absorb security-wise. In other words, they won't allow for quote unquote security reasons, Palestinian hospitals to have radiation equipment. What that means is that you then need to obtain an Israeli permit to be able to get radiation or and some other types of treatment inside an Israeli hospital. Again, that's a security permit. If you are a person who um, wants to work as a, uh, in any shape or form of work, as, as a person who's from a Palestinian West Bank town to a Palestinian town uh, inside Israel or any other um, city. Again, you have to obtain a security permit. And so what Israel has done is that this isn't just a question of, of, it can't, of can't cutting off security collaboration with Israel, which is a good thing. It's that Israel has so tied in uh, Palestinian civilian life into this issue of security that I'm, I don't think that it's going to be sustainable for the Palestinian Authority to maintain that cut in ties. And that at a certain point, it's going to be forced to go back to resuming its relationship with Israel, unless, unless it comes up with a completely different model. And that is something that so far we have not yet seen. Instead, we've seen that while they are protesting the issue of annexation, um, and they have called for sanctions, which is the first time ever, that they haven't really conceived of a different model to challenge Israel. They haven't pushed for accountability. They haven't been, um, for example, saying that they're giving up on the peace process. In fact, they, just today they announced that they would be willing to resume negotiations. And so unless they pursue a very different model with a very different strategy, we are going to be seeing a resumption, sadly, of all of this um, security uh, collaboration, cooperation. Right. And in this context, I think it's important also to note that the bulk of the resistance has been carried out by ordinary Palestinians themselves, mm -hmm. uh, both in Palestine, of course, and in other parts of the world. So we've of course seen the Great March of Return protests, which almost for a year kept the flag of resistance flying and many other such initiatives. So are some of the models you're talking about being discussed slash or, pre or proposed in this resistance from the people or what is the kind of resistance building up right now? Oh, definitely. The, the only uh, people who aren't talking about resistance is the Palestinian Authority. It's been really remarkable to see the various responses to annexation. Everything from, um, from people who are saying it's time to abandon Oslo to people who are saying it's, a, it's time to abandon the two-state framework, people who are calling for one state, uh, people who are supporting um, farmers in their attempts to be able to stay on their land, um, various measures to try to block settle, uh, settlers from, from firebombing many of the orchards in the West Bank. We've seen a lot of resistance, some measures small, some measures big, but all of it are surrounding the same idea, which is that we want our freedom. We've even seen that Hamas and Fatah have come together because there is no real dispute between them when it comes to um, what the outcome is. We all want our freedom. None of us want to live under Israel's thumb any longer, or under Israel's boot any longer. And so that part has been uh, very heartening. What's been disheartening is the fact that the Palestinian Authority remains wedded to this framework, a framework that failed for, um, for, for you know, now 27 years. Absolutely. And finally, I have a question about the situation in Israel itself. So over the past couple of years, we've seen a considerable shift, of course, to the right. And this happens even as Netanyahu has been embroiled in corruption cases. There's a loss of faith in the political system. Multiple elections have been held, which haven't thrown results. So has there been, even amid the right-wing shift, has there been also some form of 
uh, a protest movement or some form of resistance building in Israel itself, or is it just a complete shift to the right? That's a really good question. Um, it's small. The resistance movement is small and in some cases a little bit misguided. So on the issue of annexation, there's been um, two types of people or two types of resistance to annexation. The, the bulk of the resistance to annexation, and this is the bulk, is people like um, the, the quiet group that I was talking about a little bit earlier who say, we can have our cake and eat it too. There's no need for us to, to prod the international community. We can continue to build settlements. We can continue to erect checkpoints. We can continue to steal Palestinian land. Why do we have to be so bold about it? And so this is what you've heard from um, former Israeli generals. You've heard this from former Israeli prime ministers who've all repeated the same mantra. And so the idea that they're part of the resistance is a joke. There's another smaller um, type of resistance, and that's the much more principled resistance, and that of people who are saying annexation is wrong because it's illegal. And annexation is wrong because it, it changes um, the international world order. Annexation is wrong is because it sends the message to the Israeli settler movement that it can do whatever it wants. And so on that, um, that group of people who have been resisting, it's primarily Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel, but there, also, there are also some uh, Jewish Israeli citizens who are saying that um, we really need to wake up and recognize what all of this means and where it is that we are going and where it is that we're taking, um, the, where, where it is that we're taking Palestinians in the region as a whole and the world as a whole. And so on that part, it's, uh, it's small, but the numbers are growing. Thank you so much, Jaira, for talking to us. My pleasure. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch.